الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brothers and sisters Oh, brothers and sister, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tonight is devoted to only questions and answers. And I have a huge number of questions. So we will, because my bahasa is not good. So we will use only the English language and those who do not understand afterwards you can explain to them the answer and the first question and it is a question which is constantly posed to me so I would like a chance to answer it so that I don't have to get emails coming the question is, Sheikh, why do you no longer visit Britain? And why do you no longer visit the United States and Canada and Europe and Australia and these countries and India and now even Pakistan? There are large numbers of Muslims in these countries who would dearly love for you to come e even France where they speak French and they are constantly inviting me and I am constantly declining and they want to know why and my answer is that I do so for the same reason that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam made hijrah from Makkah why did he leave Makkah? answer because of a problem of security and I choose not to go to these countries because of a problem of security that's my first answer and I should have the freedom to decide what is security for me but there's also a second reason and it is this that in these countries you have governments which have sent their armed forces into Iraq into Afghanistan and other countries and these armed forces are waging unjust war on my people barbarian war on my people war with no law of ethics war which does not discriminate between combatants and non-combatants war in which you kill women and kill children and destroy homes and kill innocent people and you don't care at all about it you call that collateral damage Islam has a higher standard of morality than that Islam has something far superior to offer to mankind 
an ethics of warfare which is far superior to your barbarian ethics of warfare. And so out of respect for the blood of my people, out of respect for those who are fighting you so courageously, sometimes only with stones in their hands, out of respect for them and in solidarity with them, I choose not to put my foot in your territory. I do not do so with arrogance. I do so with profound sadness. Because the civilization which today controls the world is now being hijacked. Hijacked. And taken, take, and being taken on a road which will destroy all of mankind. The next question is, why don't you visit Singapore? And uh, while many of you already know it, there are some who do not. And so let me make an explanatory comment. I have had profound affection for Singapore because my teacher's teacher, Molana Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahimahullah, visited Singapore many, many, many times in the 1920s, 1930s. And indeed, there is a masjid in Singapore which has been built and named Masjid Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahimahullah. And his student, Molana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, who was my teacher, he was sent to Singapore in 1935, when he was just 21 years of age, to spend one year in Singapore preaching Islam. And because I am the third in the line, I always had this desire in my heart to visit Singapore and to continue the work that they had begun. I visited Singapore for the first time in 1988 and I was very warmly welcomed by the Muslim community. And I continued visiting Singapore until 9-11. And by that time, by Allah's kindness and grace, I had already become perhaps the most popular speaker on Islam in Singapore in the English language. But when 9-11 took place, the Muslim community of Singapore responded by flooding to my lectures in such large numbers that no hall could accommodate them. And people would have to go back home because there was no space in a huge hall. The government of Singapore responded through the organization that they controlled by then denying me a permit to speak. That is Singaporean democracy. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to speak. I can enter the country, but I cannot speak. Shame on you, Singapore. Shame on you. <laughs> I don't speak with bitterness. <laughs> I speak with sadness that you should deny a scholar of Islam the freedom to speak. So then we chose to use a small room that could accommodate about 40-50 people. And I would give a talk for about 45 minutes and they would leave and then another group would come. But there were three, four hundred people outside waiting to come. So then I got a message, you're breaking the law. Well then, we started giving talks in people's apartment, in the sitting room with about a dozen people present. And then finally, they decided that they cannot allow me to enter the country. So the only country in the world, the only one in the whole world, which denies me entry into the country, is Singapore. And I have a message for Singapore. 
you have pursued a terribly foolish policy, terribly foolish in becoming Israel's greatest ally in this region. It was terribly foolish of you to become little Israel because you were not looking far enough ahead. You could not anticipate that Israel is one day going to wage great wars and from the time Israel starts these great wars, this entire region in which Singapore is located would be in flames, in flames. Those great wars are about to start, maybe this year, maybe next year. And when those great wars start, I feel sad for you, Singapore. What is the fate which now awaits you? The next question is, what is your problem with Harun Yahya? I have never spoken anything about Harun Yahya and his connection with Imam al-Mahdi. I get lots of emails from people in many parts of the world telling me this and that about Harun Yahya and Imam al-Mahdi. That is a red herring. Red herring in, in English means a diversion, something to divert your attention, not important. What is important for me about Harun Yahya is that he is, he has become so influential around the world of Islam in lightning speed with a huge number of books and a huge number of documentaries all on cable television and his books for children also in schools as though one mastermind is at work to influence the thinking of the entire ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam as a consequence of which I have to pay more attention to Harun Yahya than to other scholars. He's a very influential man. And my first problem is, never in the history of Islam has Islamic scholarship ever hidden its name behind some pen name. That's not a part of our civilization. When a scholar of Islam stands up to preach or to teach or to write, he identifies himself so he can be held responsible for what he says and what he writes. And so I find it very suspicious that someone should depart from this norm of scholarly conduct and hide behind a fictitious name. Subsequently, we were told that this Harun Yahya is actually a Turkish brother in Turkey with a particular Turkish name. Whether he is or is not, is not a matter for me to pass judgment over tonight. But I want to direct attention to one book of his, entitled Imam al-Mahdi and the End Times. And when I read that book, I was profoundly disturbed because he expressed views in that book which appears to me to be views that could also come from the Israeli Mossad. This is what he says. And if I am wrong, I invite him to correct me. That when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, when the Prophet Jesus returns, the Quran tells us that the Jews and Christians, the Ahlul Kitab, will have to believe in him. And so, according to Harun Yahya, there is an end of history in which Jews and Christians and Muslims will all believe in Nabi Isa alayhi salam 
and as a consequence will become a fraternity, a brotherhood, all living together with fraternal feelings for each other. And he continues to argue that if, if this is what is going to happen at that time, then should we not now reach out to Jews and to Christians to build that fraternity now? Oh yes, that would please the Israeli Mossad Allah. This is false. This is not what Prophet Muhammad has told us. And this is not the proper interpretation of the Quran. This is false. This is deceptive. What is going to happen when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns is that a people who were acting in the same way that Pharaoh acted, waging war on Islam, waging war on those who have faith in Allah, a people who had become oppressors, who were arrogant oppressors, who had power and were using that power to oppress. That people would now suffer the same fate that Pharaoh suffered when he was drowning. The Quran tells us that when Pharaoh was drowning, the veils of course were removed from his eyes and he then recognized that Musa alayhi salam and Banu Israel had the truth. And their God was the true God and he Pharaoh was not God. And so he declared his faith in the God of Banu Israel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, and this is in Surah to Yunus, and I invite Harun Yahya to kindly look up the verse. Al-an, now Pharaoh, wa qad asayta qabr, and before this you were in arrogant objection, rejection. Wa qudda min al-mufsirin, and you were committing fasad, you were oppressing. فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ This day we have decided to preserve your physical body. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً That your physical body, when it is rediscovered, when it resurfaces in the historical process, would be a sign for a people to come after you. What is that sign? The sign is this. And since they will live the way you lived, they will die the way you die. A divine intervention cause your destruction. A divine intervention will cause their destruction. And you went into the hellfire despite your declaration of faith. And they will also declare their faith and it will be of no help to them and they will also go into the hellfire. The body of Pharaoh was discovered and the world acknowledges it. Somewhere around 1897 I believe, I can be wrong by a few years. But the Zionist movement was created in the same year that the body of Pharaoh was discovered. And, the society, and so the sign is very clear. For those Jews and for those Christians who are supporters of the state of Israel, for the Zionist Jews and the Zionist Christians, when Jesus comes back, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, at that time you will have to declare your faith, but it will be of no benefit to you. There is no fraternity between us and you at that time. Harun, you are here, you are wrong. You're misleading the people. Instead of a fraternity, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu told us what is going to happen at that time. 
And I invite Harun Yahya to quote this hadith if he has the courage and the integrity to do so. The Prophet said the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, he can check it up. Latukatilunna al Yahud, you'll most certainly fight the Jews. Walataktulunnahum, and you'll most certainly defeat them. Hatta yakulul hajar, at that time, even the stones will speak. Ya Muslim, O Muslim, Hada Yahudiyun warai, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Oh, so they'll be on the run on that day. Is the Prophet speaking about all Jews? Oh, come on. You should have a little bit more intelligence than that. No, he's not speaking about those Jews who are standing with us and opposing Israeli oppression. He's not speaking about those Jews who refuse to be Zionists. No. He's speaking about those Jews who are oppressors. They'll be hiding behind trees and stone. As a Yahudi and Warai, Fatala Faktul. So come and kill him. These are the words of Prophet Muhammad. And it's a little late. It's a little late in the historical process to try to erase those words now. And so what has been written in that book is false. And the world of Islam must be warned to reject this view presented by Harun Yahya, a view with which the Israeli Mossad would be very comfortable. The next question. In my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, I dwelt at length with the hadith of Tamim Dari. Tamim Dari came to the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam in Medina and narrated something about the Dajjal. And the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam then said to the people, sit down, I have something to say to you. Ha. Tamim Dari came to me and narrated something about the Dajjal which confirms what I have been saying to you. And then we get the event from the lips of the Prophet In that hadith, Dajjal is located on an island. In that hadith, Dajjal is located on an island. To save time, to save time, I'm not going to give you the arguments in support of my conclusion. The island is Britain. So I say that when the Jal was released on earth in a day which is like a year, this is the first stage of his mission, I say and listen carefully that the Jal now uses Britain in his first stage to pursue his mission to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem. Listen carefully to my words. When he uses Britain, Britain is transformed into a ruling state in the world. And so the world experienced Pax Britannica. And the sterling pound became the international currency. The world is now very familiar with my view on this subject. I'm the first one, I believe, to have suggested this. And it has been largely accepted. However, let me point out, when Imran gives an opinion, no one should accept that opinion. Let me warn you, no one should accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. When I give an opinion, I can be right, 
I can be wrong. Only Allah is free from error. All the rest of us have to revise our opinions sometime. Hmm? And so my opinion is that the island of Tamim Dari is Britain. Now the question has been raised several times. But the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, pointing to the east, 20 times to the east. The Dajjal will come to the east, from the east he will come. And Britain is to the west. So we are confused, could you kindly explain? Well, that's how some people ask me politely. Others don't do that. <laughs> Others don't do that. The answer is this. East and west. And north and south are directions in space. And they are directions in our world of space and time. Are there other worlds of space and time? Yes, there are. There are seven of them, Samawat. Do we have east and west and north and south in those Samawat? I don't know. And you don't know. But when Dajjal comes from the east, the messenger of Allah is speaking about east in this world of space and time. And so it is only when the Jal appears in our world of space and time, which would be at the end of his mission. When the Jal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week. Wasairu ayamihi ka ayamikum. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and all his days like your days, meaning all the rest of his days. So when stage one and stage two and stage three have been completed, number one, the jal has to be released. <laughs> number two, Stage 1 and stage 2 and stage 3 have to be completed. And then he is born into this world of Jewish parents who never had any children. And he grows up as a Jew. A Jew. And he would be a young man, a human being. Yes, he's going to appear as a human being. A young man powerfully built with curly hair it is at that time he declares that I am Al-Masih, the Messiah it is only after he declares that he is Al-Masih, the Messiah that we will recognize that this is the Messiah this is the false Messiah excuse me before that we would not know so it is at that time that he would come from the east. But prior to that, stage one, I say the island is Britain. I hope that this answers the question. When his day is like a year, how long a period of time will that be? Oh, but I have, I have given only one answer. Others have given many answers. But Imran Hussein has given only one answer. And I have said it's going to be a long period of time. I never said it's going to be a thousand years. 
others may say so and they will defend their views and they have the right to express their views all I have said is going to be a long time and then in a day which is like a month and the United States replaces Britain I have said it's going to be a shorter period of time and then a day which is like a week and my opinion Israel replaces the United States I said it's going to be a very short period of time hmm? we can of course engage in plausible guesswork but it's guesswork and my guesswork is that Israel would rule the world as a third ruling state for maybe 20 30 years but would the world of Islam submit to Israel or oh, the part-time Muslims the ones who are so proud of being moderate Muslims <laughs> they, will, they will not stand up against Israel but the true Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam will never submit to Israel as a ruling state no we will oppose Israel and we will defend ourselves against Israel until the last Muslim stands on the face of the earth we will never bow we will never submit to Israel hmm? next question pertains to something that is a matter of very great importance in Pakistan and there are many in Pakistan who are going to be listening to this session Ghazwa is a war in which the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam participated Ghazwa otherwise war is harb for some reason which I cannot explain there is this tendency to use the word Ghazwa for a war which will take place in Akhiru Zaman against a Hind a Hind a Hind is that entire area which today comprises India Pakistan Bangladesh that is Hind and there are a hadith and I am not in a position to assess the authenticity of these hadith no that a Muslim army will conquer Hind a Muslim army fighting in Akhiru Zaman would have to be an army of Mujahideen Mujahideen I don't know and perhaps you can help me and correct me whether any armed force of any country in the world today including the Pakistani armed forces have ever described themselves or will ever describe themselves as Mujahideen huh? do please do please correct me and do please send me the evidence that the head of the armed forces of Pakistan ever describe his soldiers as Mujahideen engaged in Jihad I don't think armed forces of secular nation states use that kind of a language no secondly the army which will conquer Hind and today India is Israel's most strategic ally in the world after the United States hmm? so of course if this is going to take place I'll be very happy about it oh yes this is Israel's most strategic ally and if a Muslim army is going to conquer Hind it'll have to be an army that is also opposed to Israel is the Pakistan armed forces like that correct me if I'm wrong 
But since 9-11, it's almost 10 years now since 9-11. Since 9-11, the Zionist movement, the Judeo-Christian Zionist movement, which today controls the government of the United States and controls Britain and controls NATO, launch what they call the war on terror and you and I know that the war on terror was actually war on Islam the only people who don't know that are the governments and the people who control newspapers and television but the rest of us know that war on terror was war on Islam and correct me if I'm wrong I believe that the Pakistan armed forces have actively supported the American war on terror for the last 10 years and have received handsome rewards in US dollars for that. Is this the armed force that is going to conquer India? I don't think people with even five rupees worth of intelligence would accept such a proposition. It is not my intention to be disrespectful at all to the soldiers, to the men in the armed forces of Pakistan. I'm sure that I probably have lots of fans amongst the armed forces in Pakistan. Those, however, who command the strategic decision making in the Pakistan armed forces, and who control strategic decision making in the government have for the longest while remained on the side of the Zionist movement. And so I say you have to be actually living in Disneyland to believe that the Pakistan armed forces are going to be the force that is going to conquer India. Excuse me for my language. Excuse me for my language, Pakistani people. But that's nonsense. The next question, are you Imran Hussein, are you a Shia? No, I'm not Shia. <laughs> are the Shia Muslims? My answer is yes. Only Muslims are allowed to perform the Hajj. And to the best of my understanding and knowledge, the Shias have consistently been allowed to perform the Hajj throughout the 1400 years of the history of this Ummah. I don't know if there were one or two moments where they were not allowed, but that's irrelevant. Because for 99% of the time, the Shia were perform, uh, performing the Hajj. And even to this day, the Shia are performing the Hajj. And therefore, the ijma of this Ummah is that the Shia are Muslims. And I think it's a little bit late now to come with a fatwa. That the Shia a kuffar. I am not Shia, but I consider them to be Muslims. And I relate with all my Muslim brothers and sisters the way I ought to relate to them. If a Muslim brother or sister is on the path of error, then I must correct them. But I must not correct them with hatred in my heart. I must not correct, correct them in a destructive way. I must correct them with love in my heart and I must correct them in a constructive way. No, I'm not Shia and I'm not Deobandi and I am not Brelvi and I am not Salafi and I am not Tablik Jamaat, I am not a part of the sectarian divide. And I don't want to be a part of that sectarianism. I abhor it. On the contrary, I am struggling to build a model of a Muslim village. Everybody knows that. And in this village, I want the Sufi and the Salafi to live together in the village as brothers. And so I am struggling for unity amongst Muslims. And I recognize governments can't unite the Muslims. 
No. I recognize that the only thing that you could not unite the Muslims is the Quran and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And so once we stay firmly with the Quran and with Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, I have confidence in my heart that we can live together despite our differences. There is a hadith about Dajjal. We, we're moving from subject to subject, not consistently, so it'll keep you awake. You won't fall asleep. <laughs> there is a hadith that Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shawls. You, you heard the hadith? Huh? Good, you're shaking your heads. My opinion on this hadith, and remember, when you find a hadith pertaining to Akhirul Zaman, and Imran Hussein does not, does not touch on those hadith, the implication is that he's not as yet comfortable that he has penetrated the hadith. There are some ahadith pertaining to Akhir zaman that you'll only understand after certain events unfold in the historical process. And so, little by little, I am moving forward. Little by little, one step at a time. When I get a hadith that I believe I understand, I then offer my opinion, but I qualify, do not accept my opinion, please, until you are convinced that it is correct. The Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan, wearing their Persian shawls. And so, immediately, I come to the conclusion that these will be Jews who will have Muslim names. <laughs> because they're coming from Isfahan and they're dressed up as Iranians, Persians not as Jews so this will be a hidden force emerging out of Iran that will be supporting it Dajjal externally appearing to be Muslims but internally supporters of Dajjal And so I am anticipating now that there are going to be great changes in Iran. And through this talk, I'm warning the Iranian government and the Iranian people that the attack is coming. Yes. Because I hold that the Iranian government is sincere in its opposition to the oppressors who now rule the world. You can have other views, but this is my view, that the Iranian government is sincere in its opposition to Israel. I reject the view that the Iranian government is insincere and they have some secret, secret pact with Israel and they're just throwing dust in our eyes. No, Imran Hussein does not think like that. An Iranian government which is sincere in its opposition to Israel is not something that Dajjal will accept. No. He wants to use the Shia divide. He wants to exploit the Shia sectarian movement to his advantage. And so he needs a government in Iran that will be first Shia and then Muslim. And so I expect that the attack will take place on Iran. Of course, the attack would be for destroying the nuclear plants. That's all the hype about nuclear plants and nuclear weapons and so on. But I want to suggest that the more important reason for the attack on Iran would be to remove this present government and to replace it with a Karzai-type Afghanistan government in Iran that will submit to the Zionists 
and therefore become camp followers of Dajjal. And that is when this hadith will be fulfilled about 70,000 Jews. When uh, Iran is attacked, which I expect to take place this year or next year, because that's why all it is drum beating about 2012. I also expect that they have already groomed an Imam al Mahdi. They have chosen somebody and they have programmed him and groomed him. <laughs> and and he is going to announce that he is Imam al Mahdi. Hmm? Israeli Mossad work. And, and I expect large numbers of Iranian people are going to be deceived because they are waiting and they are expecting and the Iranian government is fueling the fire with announcements about the imminent arrival of Imam al-Mahdi but he will not be Imam al-Mahdi oh no he will be a false Mahdi and we have to be very careful about that the true Imam al-Mahdi in my opinion Allah will never cause him to emerge until Dajjal has completed his mission or is very close to the completion of his mission. Only at that time would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause the Imam to emerge. And when the Imam emerges, only then would Nabi Isa Islam return. The two are contemporaneous. The, the age of Imam al Mahdi is also the, the age of the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And we are probably 25, 30 years away from that now. There is a question here about voting in elections. And on my website you will find an essay. Can Muslims vote in elections of the modern secular state? Okay. I have devoted a long, long time to the study of Akhiru Zaman, to the study of Islamic eschatology. And I have come to the conclusion that we now live in a world in which unless Unless you remain faithful to Allah and his messenger, you're going to worship Dajjal. There is no third possibility. Either you are faithfully worshipping Allah and following his messenger, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, or you're going to worship Dajjal. I have come to the conclusion that most of mankind today are worshipping the Dajjal. And so we have to constantly pray to Allah for protection from the fitna of the Dajjal. How do we worship the Dajjal? Dajjal is not going to come in front of you and declare, I am God. Come on, you dum dum. <laughs> Dajjal is not a fool. Pharaoh will declare, Ana Rabbukumul A'la. But Dajjal is not going to say, I am the Lord Most High. No. Dajjal operates with deception. He gets you to worship him without knowing that you are worshipping him. The modern state the modern secular state which has taken over the whole world was created by Dajjal I have no doubt about that the Quran informs us that Allah is Al-Malik in political terminology sovereignty belongs to Allah Al-Malik the modern secular state says no nope. No, that's wrong. Allah is not Al-Malik. <laughs> Sovereignty belongs to the state. The state is sovereign. Hmm? 
That is shirk. This is Allah's creation. And when you submit to that and you accept it, you're no longer worshipping Allah, you're worshipping Dajjal. Hmm? When you vote in elections for the modern secular state, I'm not stopping you from voting, no. And you have the freedom, you have the right to reject my views. Of course. Everybody can reject my view. Nobody has to accept it. But this is my view. And I should have the freedom to express my view. And once I have the freedom, alhamdulillah, you can choose to reject it. That when you vote in the elections, you are now endorsing the shirk and therefore participating in the shirk. Now, in the same way that I made that challenge on paper money, I said that paper currency is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram. And I said I have studied the subject and the subject is not taught in Jamiatul Azhar. Uh, excuse me, not supposed to raise my voice tonight. <laughs> Islamic uh, international monetary economics is not taught in Jamiatul Azhar. It's not taught in the Darul Ulum. So the Shayukh and the Maulana and the Muftis and the Usad who graduate from the Darul Ulum have not studied the subject. And yet giving fatwa <laughs> on paper currencies. I have studied it. And I am saying it is bogus and fraudulent and haram. And people are free to reject my view. But remember, I have given this gentle warning that if you come after me with boxing gloves and if you make the mistake of wanting to prevent me from speaking, bar me, put me in a corner, silence me, then when I can show patience no more, then I will challenge you. This is not my style to challenge people, no. But at that time I will challenge you on this issue of paper money, on that issue of the shirk of the modern state. That if you are so confident that you are correct and I am wrong, well then come and let us both raise our hands and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with utmost humility and fervor. O oh Allah, kindly curse with an eternal curse and punish with eternal punishment whosoever is wrong on this issue. I hope I never have to do that. Where is the shirk in the paper money? It's simple. Only Allah creates wealth out of nothing. Only Allah creates wealth out of nothing. Today Dajjal, who is the author, the architect of this monetary system, this is Dajjal's, this paper money is Dajjal's. Today Dajjal is creating wealth out of nothing. And if you do not understand, then outside there is my little booklet. It was 55 pages, now I have expanded it to 60 pages. The new edition, Islam, no, what? The gold dinar and silver dirham, Islam and the future of money. Next question, we've got to go a little faster now. You have been speaking about the Muslim village. Has any Muslim village been established as yet? We, myself and my students, we have plans to establish only two, only two. And we hope that these would be models. The Muslim village has to be out of the city, out of the city, in the remote countryside. What you call in Malaysia, Kampung, Kampung. I hope the people in France and Britain will learn the word Kampung now, it's a nice word, Kampung, meaning village, Malay word for village. 
It has to be the remote village. So it poses no threat to the city. We're not threatening you. Are you so scared of us that you would not allow even a few of us to go and live in the remote countryside? Shame on you. Are you going to send the police after us in the remote countryside simply because we want to live with the Muslims in a different way from you? Is that your democracy? Masha Allah. That's all we want to do. To live in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. Not to be preaching Islam all the time, to establish Islam. So this is a micro Islamic community. We do not have the Khilafah, but we are a people who in our hearts are loyal to the Khilafah. We do not have loyalty to your modern secular state. Our loyalty is to Islam and to the Khilafah. And we have confidence that Khilafah is going to come back tomorrow when Imam al-Mahdi emerges. What do we do in the meantime? In the meantime, we establish micro khilafa, small communities living very peacefully in the remote countryside. We're not going to touch your money, your bogus, your fraudulent, your haram paper and electronic money. No. In our kampung, we're going to bring back the sunnah money. When we talk about sunnah money, they don't even understand. Governor of Central Bank doesn't know the subject. They didn't teach him at university. <laughs> what is sunnah money? One village is being established in Cape Town by my students. And the second one in my Caribbean island of Trinidad. But there are many here in Malaysia who love the idea. There's a sister, I don't know if she's present here tonight. She's just 26 years of age. And she's already bought land in the remote countryside. And she has another sister who's joined with her. And they got a vehicle in which you can transport animals and these two women are taking animals into that their little kampung because of this idea of the Muslim village right here in Malaysia there's another sister who came to me these are women eh? not men these are women she wants to establish and she's probably going to be listening to this lecture on YouTube and mashallah for her, she wants to establish, she heard me talk about a weekend Muslim village. So families will come on the weekend, Yom al and then they spend the weekend and then they return huh, to their home before you have to start a work for the next week. So she wants to establish this weekend village in Jandabaik. Hmm? And I say, mashallah, what a beautiful place and what a beautiful idea. You don't have to establish a new village from scratch. No. I get so many emails and many of them from Europeans and Americans, Germans, French, Holland. Sheikh, we want to come to your village. <laughs> I say go to any village where Muslims live and you must have a joy in your heart to live with your own Muslim brothers and sisters. Don't run away from them. Go to any village located in the remote countryside and then when you get there try very gently to transform it into a Muslim village. You know you're in a Muslim village 
when you get rid of the paper money and you're using sunnah money. And if you fail, then go to another village. Next question, how can I become your student? <laughs> Masha Allah, I was a student of a great teacher. Who was my teacher? Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. Go to the internet, go to Google and write his name. Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman, F-A-Z-L-U-R, Ansari. And you see a website devoted to him. And over there you'll see his books. And you see his major work, the Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. But before reading that book, I suggest you go to the pharmacy and buy a bottle of Tylenol tablets. You don't have Tylenol? What do you have? For headache. What tablet do you use for headache? Tylenol? Panadol. Ah. Go to the pharmacy and buy a bottle of Panadol tablets because he writes in a very difficult style. You get a headache. But it's a great work. Great book. And if today, by Allah's kindness, I am preaching the religion the way I am, it is because of that great teacher. You want to be my student? This is what you have to do. You have to take a decision. I'm devoting this life that Allah has given to me. I'm devoting this life to Him. So others will work and buy their Mercedes-Benz motor car. And they're going to have lovely homes in Gumbak. And you will not have that. You will have a little kanchil. And you might be renting all your life. But the sacrifice that you make of the dunya is what is required in order to pursue knowledge and to emerge tomorrow as a scholar of Islam who will preach the deed. If you do not plant, you will not reap. You got to plant. You can begin by reading my books, by listening to my lectures. Many of the things I now teach you, I never had anyone to teach me. No. But when I return home, inshallah, which should be about one year from now, I am building a student village that in Malaysia you call a punduk. Punduk, yeah. And so you can come. A Malaysian gets only one month visa. And then you can apply for an extension, you get an additional one month. So when I enter Malaysia, they give me one month. And if I go and apply for an extension, I get one more month, then I have to leave. And then I can come back in. So, so long as you have a visa, you can stay. We build huts. That's what the Punduk has, huts. And in our huts, you'll have cooking facilities. So a husband and wife can stay in the hut, or two men can stay, two women can stay. And we give you the groceries, but you must do your own cooking. So if you come from Indonesia, we want to taste some masakan padang. So you do your own cooking. You have no expense other than your travel expense. And we will teach over a period of three weeks. One course of lectures, one subject would take about three weeks. Sometimes two weeks, sometimes one month. And so you choose which one you want to attend. And you take leave from your job and you come, inshallah. Is Imam Mahdi, or where did you study Islam? My teacher established 
an institute of Islamic studies in Pakistan called the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies. But this was not your normal Darul Uloom. No. Because when I was a student in that institute, I had teachers coming to teach me the Islamic philosophy of history. Where in a Darul Uloom today would you find students being taught the Islamic philosophy of history? It is because Dr. Burhan Ahmad Faruqi Rahimahullah had a PhD in philosophy. He taught me the Islamic philosophy of history from the Quran. That today I can give the lecture Islam and the end of history. Go on to the internet, YouTube and you can listen to it. Hmm? In our institute we studied the Islamic philosophy of science. In that institute, we had to study the foundations of modern Western civilization. Which is why I am comfortable now when I study modern Western politics, Western economics, monetary economics and so on. Because I got the foundation from the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies. May Allah bless my teacher of blessed memory, Rahimahullah. Is Imam al-Mahdi already born? I don't know. No one knows. And the only way you will know that is if Allah informs you. And he's not informed me. But secondly, and this is not arrogance, I'm not interested. This is not arrogance. No, no, no. I am not interested in knowing whether he is born or not because that is not important to me. Whenever he is born, Allah will protect him. And Allah will keep his identity secret. So I don't want to be sharing in that secret. So why do you ask me? Eh? When Allah chooses for him to come out, and that will be a time when a Muslim Khalifa will die. And here the word Khalifa means a ruler. And I believe it will be a Saudi ruler. And when he dies, there will be disagreement concerning succession. You can easily see what is coming in Saudi Arabia. With all those 5,000 princes vying for succession. Huh? Maybe when Abdullah dies, the next one will come and that will be when it happens. Who knows? It is at that time when there is disagreement concerning succession that a man will come out of Medina and hurry to Mecca. So he's not coming out of Indonesia, coming out of Medina and hurry to Mecca. Okay? That would be Imam al Mahdi who will proclaim himself to be. Imam al-Mahdi. My opinion is that we're still about 20-25 years away from that event. Next question. The Prophet said that Dajjal will not enter Makkah and Medina. Dajjal will not enter Makkah and Medina. The angels will prevent him from entering. And I say that Dajjal is already in Makkah and Marina. If you go to perform Umrah, you see Dajjal everywhere you turn. <laughs> Meaning, you see the footprints of Dajjal, you see the evidence of Dajjal everywhere you turn. Go to Makkah and Marina today. What the Hadith is saying is that at that time, when Dajjal will appear as a human being. At that time when he had attacks Makkah and Medina, he will be attacking while riding on a donkey. Eh? You know about a donkey. And the donkey will fly. It has wings. Eh? And fly faster than the clouds. And the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide. Dajjal will be riding on that donkey. 
we have interpreted it to be fighter aircraft. But you don't have to accept our opinion, no. You can, if you wish, choose to wait for the flying donkey. We have interpreted it as the fighter aircraft. The Dajjal controls the skies. If you ask the Libyan leader, he'll tell you Dajjal controls the skies. Hmm? So at that time when Israel attacks, Makkah and Medina will be barred from them. They will not be able to attack Makkah and Medina because the angels will prevent them. Next question, will Gog and Magog be released into the world only after Nabi Isa Islam kills Dajjal? The hadith is in Sahih Muslim that after Nabi Isa alayhi salam kills Dajjal at that time Allah will send Gog and Magog it never says that Allah will release Gog and Magog the word for release is located in the Quran in Surah Al-Anbiya وَحَرَامُنَ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ There is this town, Allah destroyed it, the people of the town were expelled, Allah placed a ban on them, they could never return to that town, to reclaim it as their own, tabule, tabule, until, hatta, until, until Gog and Magog are futihat, released. And then they spread out in all directions, and with their invincible power, they take control of the world. They've already done that now. Then you see these people returning to the town to reclaim it, which town? My answer is Jerusalem. You don't have to accept my answer. No. So this word is in the Quran. And that word in the Hadith is Ba'atha, to send. At that time when they sent, whatever, whatever is left of the water in the Sea of Galilee, they will start to drink it and it will be dry. The Sea of Galilee will become dry at that time. The Sea of Galilee is now close to drying up. Close to drying up. Hmm? So Gog and Magog are not going to be released after Nabi Isa Islam comes and kills the Dajjal. That is false. Next question, it is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet that when the sun rises from the west, the door of Tawbah will no longer be open. How would you interpret this hadith having stated that the sun has already risen from the west? My view, my understanding of this sign of the last day, you know the ten major signs. I'm not going to test you tonight, so you get away. Number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. Number five, the battle of the creature, the beast of the land. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three, Khusuf plural of khas, an earthquake, shaking of the earth and sinking down, one in the east, one in the west and the third one in Arabia, you had one in Taman Sri UK a few years ago. Hmm? And number 10, that the fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to the place of assembly. This one about the sun rising from the west. I am getting lots of emails, 
so many from people who are presenting so much sophisticated argument concerning polar magnetism and providing evidence that one day the earth is going to stop spinning in the direction it is now spinning and it's going to spin in the opposite direction. I am not stopping you from having that view. That's your choice. It is just that I differ with you. Am I not allowed to differ? Huh? Even if 999 out of every 1000 hold the view that the sun is literally going to rise from the west one day. That's their view. Why can't I have my view? And I am not interested in all of this polar magnetism arguments. It's irrelevant to me. All things are possible with Allah. He is fa'alul lima yurid. But my primary source of guidance is the Qur'an. And so it is to the Qur'an you must turn if you want to convince me. The Qur'an informs me that the sun rises from the east. The Qur'an says so. That the sun rises from the east. It does in Malaysia, doesn't it? From the east. Yeah, okay. And the Qur'an further tells us La tabila li khalqillah That there is no change in Allah's creation. So nature is uniform. And so a literal understanding of this hadith would be in conflict with the Qur'an. This is my opinion. I don't see why I should not be entitled to have my opinion. You can differ with me. I don't mind. What about Tawbah? I said that the sun is already rising from the west. The hadith is speaking about a false sunrise. The true sunrise from the east is Allah's sunrise. And the false sunrise from the west is Dajjal's sunrise. So where do we see Dajjal's sunrise from the west? I say Dajjal's sunrise from the west is modern western civilization. Modern western civilization shines like a sunrise that there's never been in history. It is absolutely unique. There's never been anything in history comparable to modern Western civilization. And the only way I can explain modern Western civilization is by accepting that the Jal is the architect. That it has risen from the West and it constitutes a false sunrise. And that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of the ten signs of the last day. That the door of Tawbah should be closed, this is a more difficult one. My view, and I can be wrong, is that Allah, Allah's messenger is not talking about Tawbah for all of mankind. In Akhir zaman one people stand out. One people, and they are Banu Israel. And they have consistently said they will not appear before Allah on Judgment Day singly for judgment. No. We know that we will go for judgment one by one, each person singly. But Banu Israel says, no, we are the chosen people of Allah. And so we are going to be judged as a people, not as individual Jews. And as a people, we'll get salvation and as a people, we'll all enter into Jannah. 
So it is as a people that the door to Tawbah is now closed for you. And now Tawbah is available only for individuals, not for the community. And Allah knows best. Can we consider HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, as the Dajjal means on controlling the weather? Oh yes, no doubt. The Prophet said that the Dajjal is going to control the weather. It caused the rain to fall and he stopped the rain from falling. And so the Western control over weather today is certainly the fulfillment of that prophecy about the Dajjal's control of the weather. But you cannot accept that unless you also accept that the Dajjal has been released. <laughs> Okay, modern medical treatment and medicine, that's another hadith, not the one about weather. The other hadith, and you're lucky I can't stop to ask you questions, eh? you're lucky tonight. The other hadith is that Dajjal is going to chop a man in half. You heard it? Yeah, he's going to chop a man in half and then bring him back to life. And when he does that, now do you believe that I am the Lord? <laughs> People will believe, they'll worship him now. But he is Allah, because he can chop a man in half and bring him back to life. But the Dajjal is already doing that. And people are already worshipping him instead of Allah. Go to any hospital today. And you see the surgery. Heart transplant. Kidney transplant. Tomorrow it might even be brain transplant. Huh? It is equivalent to chopping a man in half and bringing him back to life. And then the shirk. People would say, if you turn off that life support machine, he will die. And the hospital will tell you he will die because the hospital wants. Huh? The hospital. The longer the machine goes on, the more money they make. And you will believe it. How can I turn off the machine? If I do it, he'll die. Well, you dumb dumb, you are now believing that the life and death is in the hands of the machine. <laughs> the machine decides who will live and the machine decides who will die. <laughs> but, but we Muslims have a different belief from that nonsense. We believe that life and death are in Allah's hands. None can die unless Allah ordains death. None will live unless Allah ordains life. And yet you say, if he didn't have that operation, he would be dead. If we didn't take him to that hospital, he would be dead. If he didn't have this treatment from this doctor, he would be dead. And in the process, you commit shirk. You're worshipping Dajjal without even knowing that you're doing it. Next question, there are a hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Okay. He wants to know why, what criteria do I use for choosing some ahadith pertaining to Akhirul Zaman and to interpret and explain them and not mentioning other ahadith. Well, I already explained that my knowledge of the subject is increasing one step at a time, little by little, little by little. It is Allah who gives understanding. If you're constantly thinking and thinking and thinking, my wife complains. 
Oh yes, even when I'm with her, she and I alone, she demanded planning another lecture. <laughs> He's writing another book. <laughs> she complains. So, if you make the effort, then one day Allah will give you. Sometimes I go into the bathroom. When I come out, I come up with a new idea. <laughs> So it is only as knowledge advances that I'm able to understand a hadith. And if I do not speak on a hadith, the implication is that I'm not as yet comfortable that I penetrated that hadith. There is a well-known Sahih hadith in which the Prophet والسلام, said that you're going to make an alliance with Rum. Is it a surah to Rum? Rum. And in that surah, we are told at the very first ayah that Rum was defeated. Rum was defeated. Did you hear that? Rum was defeated. But in a few years time, Rum will be victorious. Who is Rum? Now if you tell me that Rum is Rome, R-O-M-E, I would suggest you go and live in Disneyland and never come back. If you believe that Rome is Rome, R-O-M-E, go and live in Disneyland and never come back. Excuse me for raising my voice. <laughs> At the time when the Quran was revealed, who was it who was defeated? Was it a city in Italy, you dum dum? Why don't you do a little bit of research before you come to this foolish conclusion? Excuse me. <laughs> no, even five rupees worth of a little bit of research. You'll know that when the Quran said that Rum was defeated, the Quran was not talking about a city in Italy called Rome. No, the Quran was talking about the Byzantine Christian Empire which had its capital city in Constantinople. I mean, only five minutes worth of research you need for that. And so don't use the word Romans. No, they're not Romans. Romans are a people who have some kind of a connection with Rome. Otherwise, I have to change the English language. Huh? And these are in Constantinople. This is not Rome. <laughs> so these are not Romans. So stop mistranslating the Quran, please. It is the Byzantine, Eastern Orthodox Christian Empire. Where is Rome? today is no longer in Constantinople because the Byzantine Empire no longer exists. But the Eastern Christian Orthodox Church and religion still exists. That is Rome. Who it is who now leads that community of Eastern Christian Orthodox believers? The answer is Russia. That's the answer. And so when the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that you will make an alliance with Rome, he was certainly not talking about a Yankee alliance. 
Someone should tell that to the Pakistan Armed Forces. He was not talking about an alliance with Britain, or with France, or with Germany, or with Israel. <laughs> when he spoke about an alliance with Rome, he was referring to an alliance with the Eastern Christian Orthodox Church. And therefore to those who now rule over that community, which is Russia. Russia. And so a Muslim alliance with Russia is anticipated by the Prophet and it will come. How soon this will happen? He also said that you will conquer Constantinople. And what a wonderful army that would be. What a wonderful army that would be. And what a wonderful Amir that would be who would conquer Constantinople. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam used the name in this hadith he used the name Constantinople. If the Prophet of Allah called it Constantinople, why did you change the name to Istanbul? I know the answer. Because you want to hide this hadith. That's why you change the name to Istanbul. But we should refer to it by the name that Nabi Muhammad used, Constantinople. This has to be a conquest of Constantinople in Akhirul Zaman. It cannot be that conquest which took place so many years ago, hundred years ago. This conquest of Constantinople will come, I believe, when the next attempt at a coup d'etat takes place in Turkey. You know, Turkey always has the coup d'etats. But you now have a Muslim government that is attempting to establish Islam and is opposed to Israel in Turkey. And you have an armed forces in Turkey which are supporting Israel. And so you're heading for a showdown. Whenever the effort is made by the armed forces to take over the country and overthrow the government, I think that's the cue for civil war. And the outcome of that civil war is what is prophesied in this hadith, the conquest of Constantinople. When that conquest of Constantinople takes place, NATO will lose Constantinople. NATO will therefore lose its control over the Bosphorus. At this time, Russian ships, Russian submarines, Russian nuclear submarines cannot pass through the Bosphorus to enter into the Mediterranean Sea because NATO controls them. But once that NATO control is destroyed by that Muslim army and Constantinople is liberated, and you have an alliance with Russia, as prophesied in the Hadith, then the Russian Navy can enter into the Mediterranean. The Russian submarines can enter into the Mediterranean from the Black Sea. And then, and then, the contest with Israel will become a more even-handed contest once you have nuclear-armed submarines in the Mediterranean. I think we're going to have to stop there. I have not answered all the questions, but uh, we'll schedule another day, not this masjid, another masjid inshallah, and uh, uh, we'll attempt to answer the rest of the questions. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samil alim wa tub alina ya mulana inna ka inta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya rahim.
there is an end of history in which Jews and Christians and Muslims will all believe in Nabi Isa alayhi salam and as a consequence will become a fraternity a brotherhood all living together with fraternal feelings for each other and he continues to argue that if, if this is what is going to happen at that time then should we not now reach out to Jews and to Christians to build that fraternity now oh yes that would please the Israeli Musad Allah this is false this is not what Prophet Muhammad has told us and this is not the proper interpretation of the Quran this is false this is deceptive what is going to happen when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns is that a people who were acting in the same way that Pharaoh acted waging war on Islam waging war on those who have faith in Allah a people who had become oppressors who were arrogant oppressors who had power and were using that power to oppress that people would now suffer the same fate that Pharaoh suffered when he was drowning the Quran tells us that when Pharaoh was drowning the veils of course were removed from his eyes and he then recognized that Musa alayhi salam and Banu Israel had the truth and their God was the true God and he Pharaoh was not God and so he declared his faith in the God of Banu Israel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and this is in Surah to Yunus and I invite Harun Yahya to kindly look up the verse Al-An, now Pharaoh وَقَدْ عَسَيْتَ قَبْلُ and before this you were in arrogant objection rejection وَقُنْتَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِرِينَ and you were committing fasad you were oppressing فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ this day we have decided to preserve your physical body لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً that your physical body when it is rediscovered when it resurfaces in the historical process would be a sign for a people to come after you what is that sign? the sign is this that since they will live the way you lived they will die the way you die a divine intervention caused your destruction it and I choose not to go to these countries because of a problem of security that's my first answer and I should have the freedom to decide what is security for me but there's also a second reason and it is this that in these countries you have governments which have sent their armed forces into Iraq into Afghanistan and other countries and these armed forces are waging unjust war on my people barbarian war on my people war with no law of ethics war which does not discriminate
discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. War in which you kill women and kill children and destroy homes and kill innocent people and you don't care at all about it. You call that collateral damage. Islam has a higher standard of morality than that. Islam has something far superior to offer to mankind. An ethics of warfare which is far superior to your barbarian ethics of warfare. And so out of respect for the blood of my people, out of respect for those who are fighting you so courageously, sometimes only with stones in their hands, out of respect for them and in solidarity with them, I choose not to put my foot in your territory. I do not do so with arrogance. I do so with profound sadness. Because the civilization which today controls the world is now being hijacked. Hijacked. And, taken, take, and being taken on a road which will destroy all of mankind. The next question is, why don't you visit Singapore? And uh, while many of you already know it, there are some who do not. And so let me make an explanatory comment. I have had profound affection for Singapore because my teacher's teacher, Mawlana Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahimahullah, visited Singapore many, many, many times in the 1920s, 1930s. And indeed, there is a masjid in Singapore which has been built and named Masjid Abdul Alim Siddiqui, Rahimahullah. And his student, Mawlana Dr. Muhammad Fadl, what is the fate which now awaits you? The next question is, what is your problem with Harun Yahya? I have never spoken anything about Harun Yahya and his connection with Imam al-Mahdi. I get lots of emails from people in many parts of the world telling me this and that about Harun, Yahya and Imam al-Mahdi. That is a red herring. Red herring in, in English means a diversion. Something to divert your attention. Not important. What is important for me about Harun, Yahya is that he is he has become so influential around the world of Islam in lightning speed with a huge number of books and a huge number of documentaries all on cable television and his books for children also in schools as though one mastermind is at work to influence the thinking of the entire Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. As a consequence of which, I have to pay more attention to Harun Yahya than to other scholars. He's a very influential man. And my first problem is, never in the history of Islam has Islamic scholarship ever hidden its name behind some pen name. That's not a part of our civilization. When a scholar of Islam stands up to preach or to teach or to write, he identifies himself so he can be held responsible for what he says 
and what he writes. And so I find it very suspicious that someone should depart from this norm of scholarly conduct and hide behind a fictitious name. Subsequently, we were told that this Harun Yahya is actually a Turkish brother in Turkey with a particular Turkish name. Whether he is or is not, is not a matter for me to pass judgment over tonight. But I want to direct attention to one book of his, entitled Imam al-Mahdi and the End Times. And when I read that book, I was profoundly disturbed because he expressed views in that book which appears to me to be views that could also come from the Israeli Mossad. This is what he says. And if I am wrong, I invite him to correct me. That when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, when the Prophet Jesus returns, the Quran tells us that the Jews and Christians, the Ahlul Kitab, will have to believe in him. And so, according to Harun Yahya, the Rahman Ansari, who was my teacher, he was sent to Singapore in 1935, when he was just 21 years of age, to spend one year in Singapore preaching Islam. And because I am the third in the line, I always had this desire in my heart to visit Singapore and to continue the work that they had begun. I visited Singapore for the first time in 1988 and I was very warmly welcomed by the Muslim community. And I continued visiting Singapore until 9-11. And by that time, by Allah's kindness and grace, I had already become perhaps the most popular speaker on Islam in Singapore, in the English language. But when 9-11 took place, the Muslim community of Singapore responded by flooding to my lectures in such large numbers that no hall could accommodate them. And people would have to go back home because there was no space in a huge hall. The government of Singapore responded through the organization that they controlled by then denying me a permit to speak. That is Singaporean democracy. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to speak. I can enter the country, but I cannot speak. Shame on you, Singapore. Shame on you. I don't speak with bitterness. I speak with sadness. That you should deny a scholar of Islam the freedom to speak. So then we chose to use a small room that could accommodate about 40, 50 people. And I would give a talk for about 45 minutes and they would leave and then another group would come. But there were three, four hundred people outside waiting to come. So then I got a message, you're breaking the law. Well then, we started giving talks in people's apartment, in the sitting room with about a dozen people present. And then finally, they decided that they cannot allow me to enter the country. So the only country in the world the only one in the whole world which denies me entry into the country is Singapore. And I have a message for Singapore. You have pursued a terribly foolish policy, terribly foolish, in becoming Israel's greatest ally in this region. It was terribly foolish of you to become little Israel because you were not looking far enough ahead. You could not anticipate 
that Israel is one day going to wage great wars and from the time Israel starts these great wars this entire region in which Singapore is located would be in flames in flames those great wars are about to start maybe this year maybe next year and when those great wars start I feel sad for you Singapore Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd We begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brothers and sisters or brothers and sister assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Tonight is devoted to only questions and answers and I have a huge number of questions so we will because my Bahasa is not good so we will use only the English language and those who do not understand afterwards you can explain to them the answer and the first question and it is a question which is constantly posed to me so I would like a chance to answer it so that I don't have to get emails coming the question is Sheikh why do you no longer visit Britain and why do you no longer visit the United States and Canada and Europe and Australia and these countries and India and now even Pakistan there are large numbers of Muslims in these countries who would dearly love for you to come even France where they speak French and they are constantly inviting me and I am constantly declining and they want to know why and my answer is that I do so for the same reason that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam made hijra from Makkah why did he leave Makkah? Answer Because of a problem of security 